Mike was doing his dissertation, he had done this really amazing uh, innovation, and I think he's going to tell us about that today. Right? How IPNT students can save the world. It's Dr. Michael Griffiths. He has, uh, when he graduated from here, he went to BYU Hawaii, serve as uh, one of their directors of outreach, uh, in instructing people at a really long distance out through the Pacific uh, Rim. And so I think he's going to tell us about the work that he's continuing to do now at the MTC. Is that correct? It's part of it. Is that a white badge? And that's the official MTC thing. I never saw a white badge before, but he's a white badger. I think that, <laughs> I think that must be really important. So listen carefully to it, Mike. Thank you, Andy. And, uh, and I'm definitely not a special person myself, but the work we were able to do in, in education in various capacities is just the special part. And I especially appreciate the uh, the opening prayer because really that encapsulated or in summary everything uh, I have a small voice as well, I'm sorry. Um, the prayer encapsulates a lot of what I want to say today. Um, I want to talk about how IPNT students can save the world through through solving problems that the world has. Because Educational learning is something that's fundamental and principle in, in, in the gospel. Um, it's one of the mechanisms and principles uh, that, that can be used for improving people's situations in the world and helping bring people out of poverty. And because it's a principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ, anybody who is involved in it in the world is in effect carrying out part of the gospel, whether they know it or whether they don't. Um, and therefore, anybody who goes into the field of education in any of its components has the opportunity and the ability to affect change. And that change can be at various levels. It might be um, with individuals. Uh, the teachers, teachers are some of the best people on the planet because of how they impact individuals' lives, hundreds and thousands in, in, in cases. And then uh, in programs such as IPNT and other similar, <coughs> you have the opportunity to affect communities, schools, districts, dates, nations and eventually take over the whole world, that's the plan. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the opportunity to develop the skills, here, to bring your backgrounds and your skills and talents and then into a program that's educationally based and then go out and, and make a difference to, to the world. Um, there are people, other people through, um, who've been in this program who've made a difference at, at big levels. Richard Collato, I don't know if anybody knows who that is, but he's now working for the government in instructional psychology. So he's, he's impacting the whole country. And there, and there are many others who impact, uh, people in this room who impact state, state level, multiple states, and, and school districts, and communities. And it's just what a, what a wonderful opportunity it is to, to do something to, to serve, serve the world. My, my whole desire has always been just to make, make a difference, do something good and, and do something in a gospel context. I, and I, I joined the church when I was 19, so I wasn't always a member of the church, but that's been my driving uh, force ever since. And, and the only thing that uh, would bring me joy these days is to do something like this. And so everybody who's in this field has the opportunity to, to make that difference. And I want to talk about a few uh, case studies. So I'll talk about a little, little bit first about Oh, and then, and then being guided by the Spirit, and that's why I want to link to the prayer. Because I find that so many people who are in education feel that they were prompted to go into it. I mean, how many people go into education for the financial rewards that they're going to receive? I don't, I don't think many. There, there may be a few people who build programs who end up uh, doing all right, but, but for 99% like of us, uh, we feel led into it because of wanting to make a difference, or we're prompted. And if, if I had the time, I could spend a whole seminar talking about how I ended up even in a program like this. It was it was totally the Lord who decided to do that, and um, and he, he leads and guides us. And and because he leads and guides us, he can lead us and guide us into into making these changes in enormous ways. And they, those enormous ways might be with individuals, and those individuals might end up changing the world, or it might be <coughs> at the program level of any of these other levels. So I want to talk about a little bit about um, my experience, and it includes the experience I had here in the European and T program. Because one of the wonderful things about these programs, so I came back to school when I was 32, and I'd already had a career in technology. I'd run some businesses, I'd worked for the church and technology in Europe and Africa, and done a variety of things in technology, but my whole life was technology, um, mostly in, in computer software. 
And the Lord decided to make a change, and he completely changed me, I ended up in the field of education. And so when I came into <coughs> the field of education, I came with a, with a background of technology. And while I was doing, and it's really interesting because I had no idea I'd end up in IPT. In fact, um, Jeremy Brown, who was also a, a product of the IPT program, I was actually thinking, I came back and did a, did a major in, in French. When I was young, I, ne I never had a bachelor's degree. So when the Lord sent me back to school, he sent me right back to the beginning. And I was a 30-year-old freshman. It was a lot of fun. And um, uh, so but at the end of that, I had no idea what I was going to do. And I, I started doing the French master's program. And while I was taking one class in that, Jeremy Brown, who, who also did some French, was in that class. And he, and he told me he was in this program called Instructional Psychology and Technology. And I heard these two words, psychology and technology, and I really <coughs> like those two words. And, and for some reason it sounded interesting and interested, so I ended up applying to it. I had no idea where it was gonna, what it was about. Uh, and I, it, I think it took me two years into the program before I had any idea what it was about. It's one of those kind of <laughs> programs, but it leads to multiple different, different things. But here I was in the program, that's where I was supposed to be. And, and then I, I loved it, because I loved interacting with the, the, the teachers and, and the students. It's, it's, a, it's an awesome, wonderful program. But what happened was interesting. I had no idea what I was going to do for a dissertation. I had lots of wacky ideas, Charles, um, Charles will be able to tell you all about those sometime. Um, and some of them were, were totally unfeasible, but there, there came a semester where I was, I was teaching the IPNT 286, 287 class, and like, like a lot of you do, and after that one semester, uh, Dr. Graham, who was kind of running that program, just asked me whether I would, would help design an online class. And this is kind of like the beginning of all of this. So it's all his fault. Uh, and uh, so, what, uh, but because I'd had a background in technology, all of a sudden ideas that have been, been running around my head for a long time suddenly came to the forefront, having taught this class um, to, to live people. Anyway, so we came up with this idea, and this idea was to use what we call asynchronous video to have students to, to produce their, uh, their to, to give us an understanding of their knowledge or some concepts and also give feedback to them and do an exchange with, with individual students by sending and receiving videos. Actually a pretty simple concept. And the concept came about in my mind because of situation. This, I want to talk a lot about this. It's because of um, the ability to solve problems based on problems we've experienced. A lot of my experience and things that I've been able to do have come about because of situations that I've had problems with and therefore solutions that I've kind of been thinking about for those, for those problems. And the problem was this. I had, so my family's all back in England. My wife's in, family's in France. And so to keep in contact, we would, we would Skype uh, from time to time. But it was really annoying. Uh, I didn't find Skype to be a really great experience because the time zones was a problem. It was never con exactly convenient for both of us. Uh, technology would be a problem, either their end wouldn't work or my end wouldn't work. And then when we did talk, it seemed to be like we didn't always know what to talk, talk about. It just, it, it wasn't great, it wasn't great quality all the time, just because of uh, the, the timing and, 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 and other things. And what happened, we end up, ended up not liking that so much. I ended up just recording my kids doing fun things or Christmas events, putting them on YouTube and sending the links to my family. And what I discovered was that kept us connected just as good as the live event did. And, and that had been going on, and then we came to this, this opportunity to create a class, and I just had this thought that connected these two things. I wonder if that would work in education. And so we just, we just started it. So that first class, we had students, um, the first thing that happened is they watched an introductory video of myself. We never met, we never met physically. And then, and then I required each one of them to send me a, a video of themselves, introduce themselves, tell me something unique, uh, share your testimony, something like that. And I got these amazing videos from all, from all these students telling me all sorts of weird and wonderful things about, about them. And then, then within a day, I would send a video back to each one of them, um, just, just thanking them for it, connecting back. And then about three or four times in that semester, we asked them to, instead of maybe write an essay about something um, as one of the things that they produce, I asked them to, to do an oral presentation on a video to present their understanding of something. And then when they did that, I would watch it, and then I'd send, send a video back to them, giving them personalized feedback. And at the end of that semester, what, what happened was kind of a, a really kind of strange discovery. The students really liked it, and they, and they liked it so much, some of them said that they knew me better than their face-to-face -face teachers. And it came as a surprise to us. We were just kind of testing it to see if it was even close to helping us re maintain relationships, which is really important to me in, in education. But they liked it a lot, and, and the reason was it was this personalized interaction. 
they, they, the, I saw them, they saw me, we knew each other, and, and then it worked. So anyway, so that, at the end of um, my PhD, I was hired out at BYU, BYU, BYU Hawaii um, to, to start their online learning program. So we took that model that, that, that was the, the topic of my dissertation, and we built the whole program around it. And I'm just going to make everybody jealous for a second. Because you know, when, we left, when we left England, it was all based on promptings. And, and that's a lot of fun. If you ever want like, a, mm. like a, a rush in your life, hand your life over to the Lord, and he'll take you all sorts of wonderful places. Uh, he, may, he, might, he might send us to Siberia or to anywhere else. At the end of my dissertation, I was kind of worried, because in the, in the church, um, which is really what I want to, to work with, um, to, somewhere in the gospel, the most likely place to go if you're involved in instructional design is BYU-Idaho, which is a really nice place. But it's really cold. <laughs> and so I was, we were really worried about where this was leading us, and, uh, and, and when, we, when we felt prompted that BYY was the place, that was like, yeah, it was okay. <laughs> uh, so, so I wish I got prompted about BYY. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's our family in front of the temple in BYY. It was, it was fantastic. Anyway. <laughs> and so then I'm going to show you a brief video. This will help explain it faster than I can. The mission of BYU Hawaii Online is to provide online classes to on-campus students for flexibility, prepare international students academically, spiritually, and in the English language, provide educational and spiritual opportunities to international students who are not able to attend BYU Hawaii. From its creation in 2009, the online program has grown rapidly and is now delivering classes to over 5,000 different students in more than 70 countries across the world, including BYU Hawaii campus. I want to pause that picture. I'm get it back. I mean, it's not obviously not everybody in those countries, but it's kind of fun to see a map where the impact of something you're doing is almost the whole world. In, in small ways, but for people almost across the whole world. It's kind of fun. What you can miss. The use of asynchronous video transforms the online class so that the students experience a high level of social presence and connectedness. Students use webcams or digital cameras to record videos and upload them to the class website. At the beginning of each online class, students introduce themselves, their background, and how they feel about the gospel. Hello everybody. My name is Vera Pong Nguyen Sai. Uh, I come from Thailand. Uh -huh. Vera City is a very small city. Uh, no uh, McDonald's. Mm. You catch that? That's that's the model by which you can tell how, how big your city is in this global community is whether you have McDonald's or not. <laughs> I know that the church is true. I I believe in Christ. I know uh, Heavenly Father. He loved us so much that He sent His Son die for us. Hi, my name is Erin Bazar. I'm from Mongolia. Uh, when I was young, I used to ride a horse every day with my daddy. So this is one of the reasons why I'm taking online course. I want to improve my English and also uh, I want to gain better education so that I can have different career in the future. Ever since I become member of the church, I have been uh, so blessed, and now I can't imagine myself without this gospel. I truly got to know about what's the real happiness since I become a member of the church. Students create formal video presentations. Students also participate in online discussions where every student is required to present arguments, and every student watches and responds to other students. Students report that the videos motivate them to succeed in the classes, <coughs> inspire them, and help them to stay active in the church. So the invention that I'm going to talk about today is called paper making. In the process of paper making, um, uh, the loose suspension of fibers in the water is drained through a screen so that a mat of randomly interwoven fibers is laid down. A lot of this in my video response to Natalie's video. I find it interesting that a lot of people tend to go in between. 
the tonality in their voice, their mannerisms, their personality, their charisma, all of that comes out by hearing and by seeing and by experiencing. Students receive feedback from teachers and tutors. Feedback can be text-based, and often students receive a video feedback. Hello, you Chen. Um, my name is Matthew. I'm one of the TAs, and I just wanted to uh, comment on your video. Um, you did a really good job. It seems that you understood uh, that indeed both uh, species or both types of sticklebacks were different. One great idea I think that you were going with at first, but kind of straight off a little bit, um, was putting them in the different uh, environments. Because we know one stickleback lives in shallow water and feeds on like crustaceans, and the other one lives in deep water and feeds on like plankton and algae. This is the story of one student from Samoa who excelled in the online classes and was then accepted to BYU Hawaii campus and now works in the online department as a student tutor. The mission of BYU Hawaii Online is to provide online... Alright, so that's kind of a, a brief summary of how it works and you can see there. The interesting thing about that, what I always noticed from the beginning is when I saw these people on videos, I really kind of got a sense of them, a taste of their individuality and their nature. And that's, that's the power of it, the seeing people. And so Sunny, that one from Thailand, who we always giggle at because she talks about McDonald's and then she has that powerful testimony. You know, I got, to, I got to feel really close to her as a student. She eventually got to campus. And it was like she was part of my family already. She was, I saw her, saw her throughout several classes, and, and you just kind of warm up to people by, by seeing them this way. And what they said is, now we had students who might be the only member of their church in, in, their, in their community, somewhere out in uh, uh, Mongolia or um, Cambodia. And so you saw, saw the other one in Mongolia. She's in her tent, in her gear, doing her online classes. And also, we, I didn't, hadn't, couldn't find a show today, but there was also this uh, sister from Fiji who was like 70 and a grandmother, and, a, and she, she decided to take the online classes for whatever reason. And, and she's in the middle of Fiji where it's still a developing world. And anyway, so there's just all these stories of these unique people. But in, so they might be the only member of the church in their town. And, but, and if they are the only member of the church in the town, they're a young single adult, it's really hard to stay close to the church when you've got no friends who, are, who you can identify with. But now what they had is they were, they were seeing people who were like them in all these different places. And what they said is it, it made them want to be active, it kept them close, gave them a community. So, so it was doing a variety of things. And that's what I really like the most. Education is great, but to me it's what is the result of it. It's the result of does it bring up poverty? Does it give, what does it give you? And, and that was one of the great impacts that it gave, gave them. So that was really exciting. And, uh, and in Mongolia, for example, what happened is, as soon as we presented the program, I'd only been there a couple of months, it was very fast growth, it was very exciting. Um, the mission president in Mongolia, who is kind of like uh, the church leader in the country, because in developing countries where there aren't stakes, the mission president was kind of the key. He liked the idea so much, he kind of got everybody energized. Before we knew it, we had hundreds and hundreds of students in Mongolia. So I went out there to present, and I had stake centers full of young people who wanted to be involved. Challenge is, and I brought this back to be on Hawaii, they only allow like 10 at a time to be on campus. And we had these stake centers full of people who, want, who wanted in. So there, there's some of the problems we, we get to solve in, in different ways. But anyway, so the whole, the whole church in Mongolia were infused about this mechanism, and, and it, was, it, was, it was fun to watch. I went out there twice, and, and that, was, that was amazing. Went out to some other places in, in, in the Pacific, and saw some amazing things. I mean, some of them, what the, the incredible thing about this is, this is the timing, and this is how, how the Lord's involved. This wouldn't have been possible several years ago, because the infrastructure for the internet wasn't available throughout the world. But, it, but, but my, I've seen this happen over the last five years. Every month it's better and better and better everywhere, to the point where it's getting to the, way, to the point where the whole world, even the de developed nations, are going to be totally connected in not too long. So these kind of things are possible. They're plausible now. So that's one situation. So while I was there at BYU Hawaii, um, we also had a student who was in the Ivory Coast. I don't know if you, any of you know about this, but they had a civil war. There was a lot going on there. They had about 10 years of, of strife, and they finally got out of it in, in 2011. But while they were still in their last piece of this, where there was a kind of like a, a uh, they'd had an election, but two people claimed that they had won, so there was a little war going on for that. I had this student who, who, who was trying to take online classes. So he was Skyping with me a lot. We were building a, a friendship. He, for some reason, he couldn't do it because of the problems there. But he finally got a scholarship to come to the Hawaii campus. 
So he, so he came, studied there, and then he came to meet with me and asked me whether I would help him in another project, in which he had this, this idea. He'd grown up in cocoa plantations. His father had tried to stop him going to school, make him work in the cocoa plantations, and he escaped from that, went to live with his mother in another part of the country, and, and eventually managed to, to, to get educated enough he could come to be in Hawaii, a very intelligent young man. And he had this idea where he wanted to go back to his country and create schools uh, to get the children out of uh, child labor in the cocoa plantations. So he came to ask me about it, if I'd help him do the educational part of it and set up the NGO. So we did that, we started, and, uh, and uh, started it going. Uh, the, and the principles were going to be based on this whole program of BYU Hawaii Online. Because one of the, one of the things that we, that we did, because using this video this way, it makes it really scalable. It makes it, it crosses the, the time zones and, and other issues, and also other things we did in that program. Because when I got there, and this is another thing about problem solving, they basically said, we want to build our online program, and by the way, there's really not much money to do that. So they, put me, so they gave me a problem to solve. So we had to solve it, and we solved it by doing some creative things about uh, course design. For example, many online programs, what they do is, they, they feel like they need to completely redesign some content area to make it an online course. That's one way of looking at on, online design. But through this experience we'd had, what I'd had here, when I taught the class for IPNT, I didn't make a new class for the online, I just took the same principles, the same materials, and I put as much of it online as I could and added what was necessary to fill in the gaps. So there was no real redesign, there was just, just putting it online. So BYY, what we said is, we're not going to redesign courses. The teachers are the designers. They've been designing their courses for years. So we're just going to make their course work online. So we didn't spend much money on design. And because the deployment is so simple and scalable, it became very cost effective. So the idea was to take something similar and put it in, in these schools in the Ivory Coast where the technology was available. So that happened. And then in the meantime, as always happens with me, I got a little bit bored after a few years because the, the program was built. And it, it kind of stabilized. We had students all over the world and we had 50 something courses. And so I got a little bit bored, so I decided I would volunteer to coach the soccer team as well. So I did that for a little while because I was bored. And, and, but anyway, I knew, I knew change was coming, so eventually I, I saw that there was a, a position at the MTC to help them uh, develop online learning for missionaries. So I thought that's exciting, so I applied for that and got, was hired at the MTC and came in December. And this was really fast. And that was a bad time to leave Hawaii, by the way. <laughs> if you're going to leave Hawaii, don't do it in December to come back to Utah. Especially for the worst winter Utah had, has had in thousands of years. So, <laughs> so that was hard. Anyway, so, that was the, so we came back in December, started working at the MTC, because shortly before that, President Monson announced that, there would, uh, that, that we changed the age for missionaries, which is I always kind of get amused about this. I bet you everybody who works in the MTC and in the church was watching that and going, that's really cool, and then went, wait a minute, because all their jobs are impacted by it. <laughs> so you have all these missionaries that are going to, and not enough MTCs. So it was another problem that's been, been presented. So they had this dilemma between, uh, are we going to build, we spend a lot of money on, on new MTCs, or do it some other way. So some committees were formed, and I was asked to be on a committee uh, uh, by the First Presidency to help, to help decide the future of uh, missionary training. And all of that's still being presented, so we can't talk much about that, um, <laughs> except for... Um, so the MTC, one thing we've done is a pilot of a Spanish language learning, because the biggest issue is language learning. Uh, missionaries that, that do, do English speaking don't stay for very long in the MTC, and they've even cut that down. They've gone to two weeks and three weeks. And, uh, but, but language is 12, was 12 weeks or nine weeks. Now it's already, mm, I think it's nine weeks or six weeks. So nine weeks if it's complicated language, six if it's apparently the simpler languages. Um, so that's really the biggest issue, is that all these missionaries staying for that length of time in the buildings. So if you can solve language online, then you can solve the, bu the building issue. So we created a little pilot for them based on the same model and built our own little website for it. This, this whole system I'm showing you here is a full language learning system for Spanish missionaries that we piloted with uh, some missionaries. And this, has, this is kind of an unofficial pilot thing. It may or may not be the future, so you can't go away saying this is what we're going to do, but this is, this is a, a pilot we did with some missionaries. And so they, once again, let's, let's go to testify. So there are five units of many, many different things they have to do, and they watch these videos, they, they do some vocabulary exercises, and they watch these videos. 
In this video, we will help you testify by stating the truth using the verb ser. We will practice phrases like, Yo sé que Dios es perfecto. Watch and listen. Yo sé que Jesucristo es el Hijo de Dios. Nosotros sabemos que... So they watch those things and they have... Then they have to write... So is this designed to be done in the MPC or before? Like what's... Because if, if you're trying to cut it down, it would, it would, it would, to me, I, I don't know if you can even say this, but you know, you take, you get your call to speak Spanish and boom, here it is, start. <laughs> or after, maybe, you know, continue yeah. learning as you get out in the field. Right, so those, yes, 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 okay. yes. Great. All, all, all Great. the above are, po are possibilities. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know where that's going to land, but all, all are possibilities. And uh, maybe even before you even have a mission call, I feel like learning Spanish. You know, maybe it's available to all members, members of the church. There. Anyway, so those, all those possibilities. Uh, because there are problems that have come about because of the age change, but the Lord knew that, and so there are solutions to all those problems. The Lord can change things in all sorts of different ways. For example, maybe, maybe young people are going to be prompted to learn certain languages at school, go to the schools that do that. Have you noticed the pop-up of these immersion schools? There's, there's a French one, there's a Portuguese one, there's Spanish ones all over the place. Maybe everybody's going to be prompted in advance. And that, anyway, there's all sorts of solutions to that. The Lord can do anything. And eventually, when they get to the end of these you know, uh, sections, then they have to do a practical exercise where they, um, they read about a certain investigator and then they have to testify to them in the language. So if, once again, this would be, if I had my... Uh, webcam, I would, as a missionary, I would record myself doing that and practice just as I would. And interestingly enough, this is kind of a hard message for a lot of people in education, but some of these methods are more powerful than being able to do it in the classroom because in this method I can have every single student do the same amount of practice. And, it, and with language, we know that it's, it's the amount of time you're on task. It's, you've got to just do it and do it and do it and do it and then have somebody to, to tell you where you're, you're making mistakes. You've got to, um, anyway, so this is a method for doing that that, that, that proved, uh, so far as proving, well, we haven't had missionaries go through the whole thing yet, but they've gone through some of the units. How do students get feedback once they've uploaded a video? Again, so it's a, a tutor. If somebody, yeah. so, so in, in this case, in the, t in, the, in the pilot, that same person you heard on the, on the presentation video was also the, the tutor giving them feedback. So giving them individualized feedback. And they also do once a week Skype sessions where they, they have to, uh, that teacher acts as the progressing investigator. So that replaces what they would have done in the MTC for progressing investigator. Because with language, you, you, you definitely need to have the live experience as well as the asynchronous experience. But interestingly though, the ability to have the asynchronous experience is really helpful because at the beginning it's really um, it's petrifying to, to have to do it, do it uh, live. And that, that alone stops you from being able to perform, whereas you can practice. Another thing we learned as well with the asynchronous video thing at BYU Hawaii, um, students would typically uh, record themselves several times before they post it. They didn't like their first one, so they do another one, and another one, and another one, which is fantastic. They're practicing, 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 and so that's kind of a natural thing that happens. We, um, and, and, and the feedback we get typically with the video is that at the beginning, people think it's a little bit strange because you're talking to yourself, in effect. But then as they, as they do it, they get used to it and they like it because now some other effects happen. They tell us that, that, uh, that they, they feel like they've got better at presenting. They feel like that they feel better at communicating in general because they've had to communicate so much. And, and also, here's an interesting thing that happens. It's cultural, too. In, in BYU Hawaii, we have a lot of students from, from Asia, from the Pacific. Asian students are taught in their culture not to talk in the classroom. Their culture is that they have to listen to what the teacher says, and then that's what they're going to repeat in, in exams. But they don't question the teacher, they don't discuss, they just listen. So it's really hard to get them to talk in the classroom. Polynesians have, have a similar uh, culture. <coughs> so in BYU Hawaii, the, the, the Western students, mostly American students, they talk and nobody else does. It's really hard to get the others to talk. And, but what happened online is the same content, the same questions, when we, when we say your, your assignment is to post a video, they do it because it's not a classroom setting. The cultural uh, background doesn't exist and it's a requirement, so they do it. So, so we, we actually help people to talk who, who don't typically. But so that's the language uh, stuff going on at the MTC. 
again, the opportunity to, to help a, a large group and, and to help affect change upon the world, which is really exciting because it has a gospel context. So going back to the... Oh, Ben. How useful was it to get class members responding to each other's... Um, okay, so the, the discussions. The discussions, the students really liked because they got to see other people, and, and we typically do it... So the discussions would function a little bit differently to in class. In class, you might, a teacher might say, it might lead a discussion, and, and a small group will dominate, and some people won't speak, and it's just one of the, the dynamics of a classroom. And you cannot have everybody have, a, have the opportunity to have a good uh, discussion because it's just not enough time, so we're restricted by the time. Online, what happens is, well, we typically set up a discussion by saying, here's the analysis question, post your interpretation, your response to it, now go and watch three other students, or four, or, or whatever it was, and watch theirs and respond to them, and tell them what you disagree with, what you agree with, analyze what they said, and, and, and so they would watch, everybody would have to participate, and they would also have to listen to at least a few others. And what we found is that they really liked that because, because of that hearing other people, they really generated ideas for themselves. And it's interesting because it changes the paradigm a bit, I think that the most vocal students in a normal classroom don't get as much opportunity, but everybody else gets more than they, they will really get because of that. So that's how the discussions work. And we do the same thing here. So, so we, we say to missionaries, um, pretend you're, you are an investigator, and you're gonna, you're gonna uh, do a video, and you're gonna tell who you are, what your situation is. Now go and watch five others and respond to them. Testify to them according to their needs. So we do the same thing with, with the missionaries and discussions. Now I want to get back to, to Africa. So, so remember back, I was at BYU Hawaii, met with this student, helped him set up this thing. Well, after I'd come back here, he, he actually went out to meet with the, uh, with the government in the Ivory Coast. There's my Facebook page. And um, it's called Well Africa. And to, to create a partnership. And, and then part of that, he had me Skype with them so we could talk about the educational philosophy. And what happened is the, the government liked it so much, they, they said, I wonder if that could apply to the whole country, because they're trying to build up education across the whole country, and they've got a major problem to solve, because they have a huge um, literacy problem, and they have this, this distribu distributed villages all over, all over the country, and, and they need to get a children educated throughout the whole country, pro pro maybe even half of the whole country do not have uh, educational opportunities. So they have an issue they're trying to solve, and they liked our cost-effective um, method so much, they, they said, how about you come over and uh, present it to us and uh, start a pilot. So I, I was over there just a few weeks ago, meeting with, with, with the government and showing them their plan, and setting up a pilot that they hope to use for the whole country. So, so, so this is a bit different. So, so one way is, so they're, going, they're going to take every uh, K-12 uh, age group and every subject and create video materials uh, by the teachers. So once again, not recreating, they're just gonna teach the same things they normally do, but create videos for every single one. And within some kind of a learning management system, we're using Canvas at the moment, put that in place with all of the tasks so that they, so that they actually have their entire educational system for anybody who needs it online. And, the, and their rationale is this. They have some schools where they have, they have maybe five different age groups, but only two teachers. And what happens is they, they kind of hire local people to come in and teach something, but they have no control over the quality. So they have teachers there, but then they have kind of volunteers from the, com from the community. So they do not have uh, quality teaching for all the age groups. So that's one problem. And where they have technology, what they can do now is for everywhere where there's not a teacher, the students could take the online version of the course in the school. So they, that solves one of their problems. The other problem is many of their schools do not have technology because they're, 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 out, they're out there in, in the villages. So, so we've got another solution for that, which we, would, we have proposed for, for our schools, which is we take the videos and put those on DVDs and then add tasks, the instructions, and, and hire volu volunteers or, or even have, or hire volunteers, have volunteers or hire somebody local who, who just helps the students, puts the DVD on, and helps them do the task, whatever that task is. So that's a solution without much technology, without the internet. Um, and our idea was to, to put solar panels on, on the schools so they, have a, they can play the TV, DVD on the TV. So they've still got a teacher on, on a DVD and somebody local can help them just work through the task. 
that's not as good as having uh, teachers respond, but, it is a, but it's definitely better than not having a teacher at all in any education. So those two solutions, they, they really like because that actually helps them solve their problems for the country. So that's a fun country-wide solution. They gave me a present in return on the second day. I, uh, I got sick because you're not supposed to eat, eat much out in Africa. Uh, it's, it's, it's a be better idea to take, take your own, own food. But I was at, at the invitation of the government, so they took me to restaurants, to their homes, and it's like being a missionary again. I had to eat everything they put in front of me. And, and uh, anyway, so I was sick the entire time, but, but I was really blessed because I had to, had to go and work anyway. So, so, so somehow that worked out. <coughs> and, and they really liked it, so their, their, in their intention is to do this program for the whole country. So that's another really fun thing. So, so here's, here's a, an example of what they did. This is just a pilot they put together. This is um, physical science for cesium, which is like 12 year olds. Oh, yeah, that up. So they have these videos that we filmed of a teacher, a teacher using technology to teach already. So he's using a piece of software where he can drag electronical, uh, electron components around to explain uh, circuits and things. I can watch that. But then afterwards, the students are required to once again do a video where they have to explain what they've just learned and explain it back as if they're the teacher. And then the rubric is, is, down, is down below. So that's the mechanism to, to use technology. And the other mechanism they would have for the video, and they would have the activity, and somebody would help them perform it. So that's that. So we've had the MTC, we've had World Africa. There's, there's also another. While we were at BYU Hawaii, we created some entrepreneurship courses. And one of them was actually uh, based on a book written by a man called Steve Gibson, who is who's from Provo. And he's a local uh, entrepreneur who also has, has some schools in the Philippines and in, in South America. Help, and, and his school is to teach students how to uh, create little, small, small businesses in situations where the economy is not strong. So how do, how do you get out of poverty by creating something small for your family? And, uh, and then since coming back, he's wanted to extend that to, to Hong Kong for, for the women there who are away from their families working there uh, because that's, that's how they're, they're creating some, some, some money for their families. The idea is to help them find a way to create, create uh, businesses, small businesses back home, which encourages them to go, go back, back home to the Philippines to be with their family. So anyway, so that's another thing that uh, we're able to help with. Uh, again, we're using Canvas for that, but that's another charitable organization that's, that's helping. And then another one, just for fun to talk about, it's another case. This isn't, this isn't an NGO thing. This is actually kind of a private enterprise, but it, it has the same kind of roots. While I was at BY Hawaii, um, I wanted to have my, my children do music lessons, as, as we often do. So um, one of my sons was, t was doing trumpet in school, and then he was homeschooled for a while. And we tried to find a teacher, and we couldn't. And, uh, and then there was some other music things we wanted to do, and we couldn't find solutions to these problems. Bioi Hawaii is on the north shore of Oahu, and it's remote. And you have to go downtown for pretty much anything. So this was a problem I was, I was facing at the time. So at the time, I came up with this idea for an online music school. I was like, why can't we use the same pro process, asynchronous video, um, show people how to do uh, the musical instrument in, in progressive videos, moving upwards, and then have them show, show what they're doing on a video, record themselves a webcam, have a teacher respond to them, give them the individualized instruction. And that, that kept in my mind, and, and now back in the mainland, I found a, a partner for that, so we started a little business called Online Music Academy, with the, with the goal to provide the opportunity to get music lessons at a much, much cheaper price. I've always had a problem with the, with the cost of music lessons when, you, when you've got multiple children, and also uh, being able to do it from home at, any, at the, whichever time of day you choose. So that problem I wanted to solve, but, but it's, it's a, it has to be a private venture. But it's still solving the problem I want to solve in the world. So those are kind of some, some cases where we've used the technology that first came out of a problem we were trying to solve here in the IPNT program. And really that was an opportunity given to me um, through the program. So I, I learned things in the program for sure, but the best part of it was the opportunities I had to 
to do something, to change something, to create create something, and that's the opportunities you get we get given. And so that was. Oh, by the way, this is just, I just found this just yesterday. This is a free little tool for asynchronous video. If you want to send send them around, it's called zigzagvideomail.com. And all you do is you do, it comes straight up on your webcam. You record it, and then it says who do you want to send it to. You send it by an email, and they get a little thumbnail in there. Video. And what happened is when we were first experimenting with, with the asynchronous video, the first semester we had to get them to record using whatever and send it to an, an, e an email, which was real, really hard because most people didn't know how to compress a video, so it was these huge files flying around, and that was not the solution. But what I observed is <coughs> right at that time, uh, technologies were being produced to, to do that. So there were some things, that, there was one called Free Gab Mail at the time, it was a free little uh, video, uh, asynchronous video thing and top box and they all kind of died in the meantime and then, and then in the meantime Canvas is, is an LMS that they've embedded that in their system and others are doing it so what I observed was as the time was right to, to, to solve certain problems that existed the technology was being developed as well and that's all, that, that to me is all in the Lord's timing and, and his, in his wisdom so the message is um, we can, we can change the world in various ways um, through through the the opportunities and the problems that, that, that we face and and the technologies and the techniques we're learning through, that we're given the opportunities to solve uh, through these programs. So uh, I'm I'm very grateful for for programs like this, and I'm especially impressed by anybody who goes into the field of education because it's really it's never it, it's we don't go into it for the money. And when I anybody I've ever been associated with who's in teaching, I always want to say thank you or an education of any type, because it's to make a difference. And these are just some cases of experience I've had where I've been able to, to help make a difference um, at, at, a, at a global level, or at a nationwide level, or a state, or whichever level. And you can. There is no reason why, uh, with these principles, with what we learn, and with, with the opportunities and the problems that exist, that we can't change the world. So go and change the world. That's my message. Mm -hmm.